officers of old who left this message for us and for the lessons that we learn from it. We pray that we may apply these and ever be faithful to thy word. Thank thee for Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Again, I want to remind you that uh, with uh, Hosea, the uh, must always keep in mind the fact that uh, of uh, Gomer and, and the three children, how that uh, stands in place of the idolatry of Israel. And it made uh, Hosea much more prepared to be able to present the, this prophecy to the people. He could understand God's uh, distraught over the infidelity of his people. He could have very well appreciate that. So he was uniquely positioned to be able to present uh, these prophecies to the uh, recalcitrant and, and unfaithful people of Israel. I think very instructive what uh, David uh, presented tonight with Noah. You know, Noah, poor old Noah, he, he never could convince anybody to uh, repent. He couldn't do it. But he only had 120 years to do it, so, you know, you, you just couldn't rush into it. So. But the fact of the matter is, uh, God has always left warning about... Uh, impending destruction he's not left the people without uh, that warning and it, even to us today we're warned about the destruction if it's going to be the United States we're warned about that destruction because we have it here we see what's happened before and we, we know what God is, is like we know the, his character and how he views uh, sin and infidelity so we know that so we've been warned too. And whereas uh, Noah preached 120 years, and in some cases in these prophecies with Israel and Judah, it was a long time before the destruction actually came, but it came. So, you know, there's a there's a unity in the message of the Bible. It is just not. Uh, unrelated stories here and there about this or that and and um, we're all left scratching our head about what is actually being taught what is being taught is that one in order to be faithful must be obedient to God must love him because he is God and uh, know what he would have for you to do and, and uh, of course obey his commandments and that was a problem for Israel uh, this was not the only prophet that uh, spoke to Israel but uh, he's passed judgment on Israel and he's, verse 10 he's talking about the princes of Judah and of course even though this is primarily about Israel, he also speaks about Judah. And when he talks about uh, remove a landmark, you know, in the when the uh, land was divided up, they had landmarks, and they weren't to move those landmarks. But here, Judah has moved landmarks, but it's a landmarks landmark of what is right and wrong, righteousness and unrighteousness. He's going to pour his wrath out on them as well. But he's primarily talking about Ephraim. Ephraim is the uh, largest tribe of Israel, and and uh, so it stands for the northern kingdom. He said in verse 13, When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jarab. Now, we don't know of any King Jarab. But it uh, is a euphemism, if you will, for the king of Assyria. So when Ephraim saw his weakness, he went to Assyria seeking an ally in the king Jerob. And Hosea said, he can't cure you. 
You're looking the wrong place. He can't heal you of your wound. He said, I will be like a lion to Ephraim. Now, a full-grown lion, when it's hungry, it eats about what it wants to. So Ephraim is going to be met by this lion, and it's going to devour Ephraim. And like a young lion to the house of Judah. Well, there's a lion that's going to eat Judah too, but it's young at the moment. So it's going to be a while before it grows up. But then it's going to eat Judah. It's going to be the same thing. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one shall rescue you. you God will always find you. If you're a disobedient, He will always find you. There is no escape. There is no one to rescue except your own obedience, your penance and obedience. In verse 15, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. So they're going to be taken off in captivity. They're going to be left alone until they acknowledge that they've sinned. Then they will seek my face, and in their affliction, they will diligently seek me. So there's going to be a, become a time of repentance. The nation of Israel will never be restored. I don't care what's over there now. It's not the nation of Israel that's talked about here. Uh, certainly there will be some that will come back, but the nation will be gone forever. In chapter 6, Come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He shall come to us like the rain and like the latter and former rains to the earth. Now, there's a question here as to what part of these three verses did it does it belong to? Is it a continuation of verse 15? Or is it part of verse 4? Now, there's uh, the thinking is that it really is a, a uh, part of verse 4 that this come and let us return to the Lord, of course, to be the people of Israel speaking, but it's a, a, a false fidelity. They can see their condition, and they can see that they're, they're, you know, the calves and the Balaam's not doing anything for them. So, out of a sense of, you know, what else can we do? You know, let's return to the Lord, but it's not a serious uh, commitment to the Lord. And this, after two days and three days, that does not refer to uh, Jesus' time in the tomb, but it's just it's just saying it's going to be a short time. If it's a continuation of, uh, if it's connected to verse 4, then probably verse 15 should have a word added. It had to be added by the translators where it says, instead of uh, in their affliction, they will dil diligently seek me, saying, these things. It's a saying. It's, it's not a serious uh, commitment on their part. And it's kind of, a, that's kind of emphasized by what's said in verse 4. O Ephraim, again talking about Israel, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew, it goes away. You know how you know, a morning cloud, you know, the sun comes out and burns it off and the dew, you find dew on the grass in the morning, then it goes away. That's, he's saying that's what their faith is like. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my, my mouth. He's passed judgment on them. And your judgments are like light that goes forth. It's going to, his judgment's going to shine on them. They can't hide. And here's a, often quoted verse, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now that's not to say he doesn't 
uh, desire of sacrifice, but sacrifice just as a uh, exercise in itself means nothing. If there's no mercy or love, then it means nothing. And all this must be conditioned upon knowledge. You cannot be pleasing to God without knowledge of God. And so he says, and again, it's not that burnt offerings are not required under the law of uh, Moses. But if it's done in the absence of knowledge, it means nothing. It's just uh, an exercise in futility. It says, but, uh, it's verse 7, but like men, and if you have the uh, American Standard, you may say like Adam, but like men, they transgress the covenant. You know, like Adam, he transgressed the covenant and thereby uh, sin entered the world. And they dealt treacherously with me. You know, the those that were unfaithful lied about God, about what he was uh, trying to accomplish, this, that, and the other. It, it, it was very treacherous. Gilead is a city of evil doers. Now, there is no city called Gilead. There's a uh, region, let's see if I can remember, it's uh, kind of in between the Sea of Galilee and the North Sea on the east side of the Jordan River. And it's very um, kind of a desolate area, very hilly, and a lot of bad people out there, out there robbers and what have you. So it, it kind of got the name for a, a place of evildoers, but he's comparing Israel to Gilead. Gilead is a city of evildoers and is, and is defiled with blood. There's bands of robbers lying wait for a man that they had a lot of robbers out there, a lot of criminals. So the company of priests murder on their way to Shechem. Now, Shechem was a uh, refuge city, so there's a lot of priests there. But he's talking about these priests. Priests ought to be... Uh, seeking for the people of Israel to obey the, the covenant, they were actually um, engaged in having them disobey because they, there was profit in it to them. So the company of priests murder on their way to Shechem. And, you know, whether it was uh, a physical murder, uh, it's, you know, it's probably a, a spiritual murder, and surely they commit lewdness. And there was uh, lewdness in the exercise of the religion in the uh, uh, northern kingdom because of the, the, the uh, uh, idol worship. He said in verse 10, I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the harlotry of Ephraim. And that's spiritual adultery is what it's talking about. Israel is defiled. Their spiritual adultery has defiled them. But it doesn't leave out Judah. Also, Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. So, a similar fate's going to await Judah. Now, it, it did happen, uh, oh, I forget the number of years, about 130 years later, but it did happen. So then in verse, uh, you know, chapter 7, <clears throat> when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity, iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered, and the wickedness, wickedness of Samaria, that was uncovered also, for they have committed fraud. The thief comes in, a band of robbers takes spoils outside. Now he's using three different symbol for the northern kingdom. Israel, that's uh, that's what it's called as a whole, but Ephraim, because it's a, the major tribe, is sometimes a euphemism for them. Israel and the wickedness of Samaria, that's the area of, of uh, Israel occupied. Uh, but here is his, uh, the notion anyway and, and, uh, that God would have healed him. 
he always stands ready to, to heal those who have engaged in, in uh, unfaithfulness. But they have to repent. And these individuals would not. Anytime one engages in uh, unfaithfulness, saying that they are engaged in faithfulness, they're frauds. And these people were frauds. Verse 2 said, They do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own deeds have surrendered them. They are before my face. Again, you can't hide your actions from God. He remembers everything. He says he remembers all their wickedness. Well, he remembers that. And he remembers all the faithful acts also. He remembers everything. And it's their own deeds, their own acts of unfaithfulness that have surrounded them and has characterized them. And they are, in, in effect, flying in the face of God. They are before my face. They make a king glad with their wickedness and princes princes with their lies. And it tells you something about their leadership when their wickedness makes the king happy. And uh, also the princes makes them happy with their lives. They are all adulterers. Now, we, we're still talking about uh, idolatry. Not a lot of them were actual adulterers, but we're talking about idolatry. Like an oven heated by a baker, <clears throat> he ceases stirring the fire after kneading the dough until it is leavened. And this may be a little difficult passage, but it has the idea that, that uh, the baker prepares things. You know, these people are preparing themselves for what's going to come. And in the day of our king, princes have made him sick and flamed with wine. And if you uh, uh, remember the political turmoil that existed during this time, princes plotted against kings, and, and I think the last... Four or five kings of Israel had very short uh, uh, terms of office, <laughs> and they were all killed. Um, and he stretched out his hand with scoffers. <clears throat> and it's kind of the idea of, of uh, taking bribes and, and agreeing with the, uh, those that scoffed at God. They prepare their heart like an oven while they lie in wait. And it takes a little while for an oven to get up to heat, and they're lying in wait all this time to, uh, to consummate their evil acts. The, their baker sleeps all night in the morning and burns like a flaming fire. They're all hot like an oven, and they have devoured their judges and their kings and fallen. There is none among them who calls upon me. So they're out doing their thing which, uh, again, given the political turmoil that's going on, it's, it's, it reminds me of Congress a lot, you know. But uh, there's a lot of things going on politically, and none is good. But in all of this, none of them actually call upon God, uh, unless it's just in a super, superficial way without really uh, any... Uh, sincerity behind it at all. Ephraim has mixed mixed himself among the peoples. I mean, he's mixed in with the uh, heathens. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Now, you know, a, a cake, you know, they used to, uh, I guess, some places still do, they have these stone ovens and you have the fire on the bottom you put the cake in but you have to turn it because it's hot on the bottom and not so hot on top <clears throat> but here Ephraim is a cake unturned now what happens to a cake that's not or let's just say bread that's not uh, turned what happens to it it burns on the bottom turns black not good for much of anything but the top is still dough <laughs> It's not much, much good for anything e either. So it's essentially a worthless uh, cake, or loaf of bread, if you want to call it that. Aliens have devoured his strength. 
this mixing with the heathen people uh, has devoured his strength. But he doesn't know it. He doesn't recognize it as being a uh, diminution of his strength, if you will. Yes, gray hairs are here, and they and they are on him. The nation is growing old. People are growing old, but they don't know it. They still think they're uh, a very healthy, vibrant nation, and at this time they probably were fairly prosperous. And the pride of Israel, verse ten testifies to his face the pride of Israel can he, it should have been God that should have been his pride but it also could be their vanity if he said the vanity of Israel testifies to his face but they do not return the, to the Lord nor seek him for all this now you combine this with the fact that they don't know it they may have gotten to the point where they just don't know how to return to the Lord. They don't know enough. They have no knowledge. And so that is a severe weakness for the nation of Israel and for anybody that wants to be obedient to the Lord. If you don't know the Lord or what He wants for you to do, how are you going to be obedient? You can't be. I think you know David's lesson is very good. You can, you can be as ignorant as a stump and say, you know, invite Jesus in your heart, and it ain't going to work. It's not going to work. You've got to know what uh, uh, God would have you to do. You have to know his word. And let's see, where was I? In verse 7, they are all hot like an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings have fallen. There are none, none among them who calls upon me. That's true. Uh, verse 8, Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. He said that uh, before. Uh, he's kind of intertwined now with the, the heathens. Uh, Ephraim is a cake unturned covered that. Aliens have devoured his strength, but he doesn't know it. Gray hairs here and there, and they don't know it. Pride of Israel, the vanity uh, testifies to their face, but they don't return to the Lord. They don't seek him. They're not even seeking him. In verse 11, Ephraim is also like a silly dove without sense. Now, those of you who have done some dove hunting, um, you know how a dove, you know, we usually hunt over water or grain fields, something like that, and you see these doves come flying over and they're just flitting here and there. And and uh, like me, you take a shot and miss and they, they flit somewhere else. And that's kind of a the imagery that's being presented here, like a silly dove. Didn't seem to have any sense, just goes here and there. They call, talking about Ephraim, they call to Egypt and they go to Syria. Wherever they go, I will spread my net on them. I will bring them down like birds of the air. I will chastise them according to what their congregation has heard. Now they saying here they're going to try to make alliances with Egypt and Assyria. And he'll talk about this further uh, some more. But uh, think about it. Egypt and Assyria are not allies. And they're enemies of one another so what is Israel trying to do trying to make an alliance with Assyria and Egypt trying to play, play uh, one off against the other and it's not going to work the Lord's net is going to going to be spread it's going to bring them down like birds of the air and he's going to chastise them chastise them they can't escape it according to what their congregation has heard, and, and they've heard plenty, but didn't do much good. Woe to them, for they have fled from me, destruction to them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. He's uh, redeemed them time and time again, 
but they didn't give him credit for doing it. And they spoke lies against him for uh, any time that you don't ascribe um, blessings or goodness to God or uh, salvation from God, if you don't ascribe that to him, then you're speaking lies. It's just not the truth. So they spoke lies against me. They, they ascribed that, that redemption to someone else. They're calves and to the uh, bales. They did not cry out to me with their heart when they wailed upon their beds. It's going to come a time that they're going to be on their beds and wailing about their uh, condition, about the... Uh, disaster that has befallen them because of the punishment of God. But even though, even though they're wailing on their beds, they're not crying out to the Lord. They're bemoaning the condition that they find themselves in. They assemble together for grain and new wine, and they rebel against me. They want the stuff. You know, like today, a lot of the uh, you know people want stuff from the government so they wanted the stuff uh, they rebelled against me though I disciplined and strengthened their arms and we must realize that in being faithful Christians uh, discipline is a part of it and discipline in trials for that matter is a means of strengthening, strengthening our faith but in spite of that, they devise evil against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They return to their old ways. They are like a deceitful bow. Now, a deceitful bow, you know, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had, you know, bow and arrow archery. And if you have a bow that's... Uh, always misses the target and mine always missed the target I don't know why but if you have a bow that always misses the target it's a deceitful bow and the bows were used in uh, warfare and if you had a, a bow that always missed the target in warfare you were in serious trouble the princes shall fall by the sword it means an army is going to come and and uh, destroy them. For the cursings of their tongue, They, this shall be their derision in the land of, of Egypt. So whenever this destruction comes, even though they had tried to make an alliance with uh, Egypt, uh, Egypt is going to, in, in essence, be laughing at them. <laughs> oh, you, you tried to... You know, get us involved in this, and you see what happened to you, and and uh, so they're going to be derided for their expectation of some sort of deliverance from Egypt. So we'll start with uh, chapter eight uh, next time. And appreciate your attendance.